Good morning, everybody. Here we are again on another wonderful Sunday. I want to read, I think, the shortest psalm in the Bible. Listen to this. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people. For his mercy and loving kindness are great toward us, and the truth and faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Hallelujah! There's a good sermon there, isn't there? Well, let's join together now and let's really praise the Lord. The whole world one day will be at that place. But today, it might just be you. It might be a couple of you. It might be a family. It might be a bunch of you in the house together. As long as it's not more than ten. But anyway, we're here to praise the Lord, aren't we? So praise the Lord, all you nations. We're in Australia, so there's saints all over Australia right this morning praising the Lord. Let's sing our songs with gusto. Let's do it unto the Lord as if he really is here with you because he is and you're with him. So let's bless him now in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.
Hi, here we go for another morning to, to give our tithes and offerings. And I know that this seems a bit funny when, you know, all you have to do now is go online and just put in your numbers and go click and, and that's it, it's gone. But what I want you to focus on again this morning, that you're giving unto the Lord. And we say this pretty well every week, but it's important that you understand this. Because as you give, you are now opening up yourself to receive. Now in the Amplified Bible, these wonderful scriptures out of Malachi, I just want to read you this. Bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now by it, says the Lord, if I will not pour open the windows of heaven, and I will rebuke the devourer. Now the devourer is insects and plagues in this context. But I want you to understand this, that the devourer can be bad habits, the devourer it can be of the demonic realm, it can be other people, it can be just a mistake that has happened to you. But the whole point is this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of the ground, neither shall your vine drop its fruit before its time, says the Lord, and all nations shall call you happy and blessed. You're supposed to be happy. <laughs> You're supposed to be blessed. That's the bottom line. There's an enemy out there. He's a thief and he wants to steal from you. But if you understand what this really means, you can then belt him in the head with the word of God. It's a sharp two-edged sword. And as you, you click on, as you put in the buttons or whatever you've done to get the money across, you just got to realise that that is a moment you're releasing. So you have to release your faith. So you need to pray over what you've just done and thank the Lord for the opportunity. Thank him for the ability to be able to give to him, to bring your tithe to him. And in a moment, it's in the system. But if you understand as well as that, that gives you the authority to rebuke the negativity of the enemy, the thief who comes around to try and take your stuff, take your joy. Realise you're in control. When you tithe, when you give, you have now set in motion the laws of the universe. God has put them in here. This is how the world works. Sowing and reaping. It's so important. It's so simple and it's for you. So be blessed today as you do this. Understand you're in control of your life and speak over your seed. Call it what you want it to be. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Say. Yeah. 
Jesus, Jesus. Good morning, church. Hope you're having a wonderful morning this morning. As always, hope you are being stimulated by the presence of the Holy Ghost in your room. And now it's time for the wonderful Word of God. So very excited to bring you the Word today. It's always such a privilege and a blessing and an honour to be able to share the engrafted Word of truth with the people of God. It's been a, a funny time, as we know, over the last number of months with all these things that are going on around the world. Um, but just want to remind you of some really good news is that the kingdom of God still reigns even though the way we've been doing church for the moment has ceased. And just because we have ceased in our normality, God is still on the throne. His kingdom still rules over everything. And this is where it is an important reminder for us to remember the kingdom of God in which we are seated, and the kingdom of God, which is now also within. You know, Psalm 145, verse 13. You are the Lord who reigns over your never-ending kingdom through all the ages of time and eternity. So coronavirus has not stopped the reign of the kingdom of God. It may have stopped us from gathering together as a body, but the kingdom still is being established in the earth. And this is a great reminder, the New King James says it this way, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Through all generations, through all times, through all seasons, through all moments, through all viruses, through all crashes, through every moment of every time that has ever been in eternity and in this place that we call time, the kingdom of God is forever ruling. His throne is forever established. And these are the reminders that it is so important for us to remember these things when our normality and our routines have been shattered and have been changed. And you know what? That's, that can actually be a really good thing. It can actually be, be a really great blessing. But the kingdom of God is still established and is still reigning and still ruling. We've spoken about the kingdom of God a lot. What does kingdom mean? We, we know the two words from nearly a decade of teaching this. The word kingdom, two words. First word, king. King means ruler, means dominion, means power, means the king, the one who sets a standard. Dom means domain or territory, a place. So it is the king's influence over the territory or domain that he rules impacting that territory and domain with his will, his desire, his thoughts, his intent. And so the king influences his territory and his domain. And that's what I want to talk on today is this, just touch on this word called influence. Because as I've just mentioned, I'm going to mention over and over and over, the kingdom of God is still reigning, it is still ruling, it is still influencing this entire earth, in spite of coronavirus, in spite of economic hardships, in spite of government shutdowns, in spite of all these things that have now become so foreign to us, or now in probably the opposite of that, have now become somewhat familiar to us, but were foreign to us, you are still seated in heavenly places in Christ, ruling and reigning in this life by the one man Jesus Christ, the book of Romans says, and it is time, especially this sort of time, where we must become acutely aware of what citizenship and what kingdom we belong to. You have to know that your citizenship is in heaven and that God is your source because these systems that you see in the world at the moment are crashing, they're coming down, economic crisis, people going crazy. In the kingdom of God is provision, stability, peace, joy, righteousness, rest, comfort, superabundance, super overflow, power of the Holy Ghost. 
This is the kingdom of which we are a part and which has been actually imparted into us. And so in the book of Matthew, I'm going to read to you a couple of parables that Jesus spoke about. It's Matthew chapter 13, and we'll start in at verse 31. And Jesus said, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. And so mixed all through. So what I'm going to just touch on for a few moments in this short time is influence. And just want to bring out some points and some correlations between these two parables. One parable talking about a mustard seed being the least of all the seeds and sown into the earth become the greatest. And the yeast, which was mixed in amongst the flour and which causes the flour to rise. And so I just want to go through some dot points here and we'll just have a bit of a conversation as we go along. First point, before I get to the first point, I just wanted to tell you the meaning of influence, just to give some more context to this. Influence is the capacity or power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, behaviour and opinions of others. Influence. The capacity or power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, behaviour and opinions, etc. of others. That is the, just the general definition of the word influence, which is in a positive sense. Let me use a negative in a sense, description of the word influence to give you another idea of what this word actually means. And it came to me, the thought, and so I looked it up, and we would all know the word influenza, or the flu. Influenza, obviously a deadly disease, probably still more deadly than coronavirus, a shockingly horrible, deadly disease, which is very infectious, easily spread, is called influenza. The word influenza comes directly from the Latin word influence. Influence was the original word, and when the, this outbreak of influ, the flu hit, it was actually called influenza because of the spread or influence of this virus or this sickness. Now, I don't necessarily like using negative um, examples, but it's just a great point to show you what influence, that's why it was actually named influenza, because it was very, very infectious upon that which the people and the areas it came across. But in the positive context, when you talk about the kingdom of God with influence, it can spread in a very, very similar way. And so you're just going to quickly look at some points regarding these two parables, the correlations, and we'll pull out some of these things within here. So the first one is both the seed and the leaven were consumed or hidden by the environment which consumed it. Both the seed and the leaven were consumed or hidden by the environment which consumed it. So the seed was sown into the soil. Once the seed is put into the soil and covered with the soil, you no longer see the seed. Or once you mix the leaven in with the flour, which is why I have a little prop right here on the right hand side, once you put the leaven in with the flour and mix it through, you can't see it anymore. And in times of that in life, it may be seeming like a really dark place. And this is why it's really important to understand the season of life that you're in. Because even though sometimes in a season you might be in a dark place, you might actually be put there deliberately because you need to be put into an environment where your nature is actually going to come forth and it's actually going to produce something greater and something bigger. So really interesting between the two points, between the seed and the leaven, they were first both placed in an environment which would have been foreign, dark and uncomfortable. Surrounded by something completely that it was not aware of, 
nor was familiar to. Point number two, neither the seed nor the leaven lost its identity in the darkness or pressure of its surroundings. This is really important. Neither the seed nor the leaven lost its identity in the darkness or pressure of its surroundings. And so when you're going through life and you're going through a dark place or a foreign place or a place you might not necessarily be able to see, do you still know who you are? Do you lose your identity when everything around you is not familiar? It's a great question um, now at the ways that we've been doing church has ceased, being able to gather together. What's your identity? What, how have you responded to an unfamiliar environment not being able to gather together? Have you, lost your in, have you lost your identity? Do you still know who you are? Are you still being able to seek the word for yourself? Are you still being able to praise and worship the Lord in your own time? Have you still been able to pray in your own time? If you're not being able to meet with people to be encouraged by, have you learned to be able to encourage yourself? Because if you look at the seed and the leaven, even though they were surrounded by darkness, they were surrounded by un, un, being un, in an unfamiliar place, they never lost the nature of who they were or what, the, what it was. Do you remember Jesus was sown as a seed in a tomb? Think about this. Jesus even said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains a seed. But if it dies, it will begin to produce much fruit. And so in the likeness, Jesus, being the seed of the word of God, was sown in death into a tomb, into a dark place, into the darkest place even of hell, but not knowing that the realm of darkness didn't know that they just let in a seed. And Jesus being sown as a seed brought forth life in a foreign environment and to the point where the tomb could not contain the seed that was sown. Death could not hold him. Sin could not hold him. Devils couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. Why? Because the nature of the seed is always to produce. Jesus was sown as a seed in a tomb. And that's why the, the, the Bible says, if the powers of darkness have known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord. What did they realize afterwards? We just let in the world's most powerful seed, sowed him in a dark place, and we just lost the power of our kingdom. And Jesus rose in power, exited the grave with the keys of hell, death and the grave with him. But he started as a seed, sown as a seed in death. Next point. This is okay. Hope you're enjoying it. The true nature of both the seed and the leaven were revealed once exposed to a foreign environment. So you do not see the true nature of a seed until it's planted and you do not see the true nature of leaven until it is mixed within the flower itself, which then produces something larger than itself. Next point. The expansion and growth of the seed and leaven only happened once it was placed under pressure. The expansion and growth of the seed and leaven only happened once it was placed under pressure. It didn't break, it didn't die. The pressure exposed its true value. And especially during a time like this, there is pressure on everyone. Everyone's under some sort of pressure. But understand, like an olive is crushed to release the oil, the people of God, though you become under pressure, when that pressure comes on you, the key is to realize, remember who you are, remember your identity, who your God is, where you've been sown, and the, the pressure that comes on you should actually release an anointing for you to overcome what you are dealing with in this moment. That's what the pressure on people, the people of God, that's what happens or it should happen, is actually releasing you an abundance of power and anointing. And we remember that this is the anointing of God which destroys the yoke. It is the anointing of God which inflicts defeat on those things which you face. So the next, I'm just going to run through these because we've only got 20 minutes. Both the seed and the leaven expanded to the point that it was able to give life to those things or people who would partake of it. Listen carefully. Both the seed and the leaven expanded to the point 
that it was able to give life to those things or people who would partake of it. The, the tree hosted the birds of the air. The bread would have been multiplied to feed many. And you can see that, remember, with, in a sense, Jesus, Jesus leavened the fish and the five loaves. He had a fish and five loaves, two fish, five loaves. He held it up to heaven and blessed it. What did he do? Actually, he filled it with leaven. Let's call it leaven for a moment. The more correct term would be called the blessing. Because when it is blessed, it is leavened, and leaven mixed in causes it to grow. The scripture says, let me look at it again. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. Three measures is in, when it's talking about this in the scripture, is about 22 kilos of flour. Also, the number three traditionally speaks to resurrection life. Jesus just didn't throw out a random number. Oh, the woman took seven, meal, seven measures of flour or two measures of flour. No, three. Why? Because three is the word and reference to resurrection. And leaven is the resurrection in your life. And when he, he sowed that leaven into the flour, that is what produced the flour to, to grow. Now, I, I put this here as a prop just to get you thinking. This is one kilo of flour. This is all the leaven that is required to grow one kilo of flour into a, an abundant multitude of bread. That's all that's needed. To me, it, it looks very, very insignificant. It looks nothing in comparison to that which it is trying to influence. And you, naturally you would think to yourself, how on earth could something so small influence something so large? Now you have to remember, remember when Jesus was talking, he was talking about 22, 22 of these. And so you're talking about 22 small of these ones. But the comparison is just to show you that even though you may seem in, see yourself as insignificant to whatever you're facing, to whatever you're dealing with, in your actual own ability to influence your, your home or your family or your workplace, the kingdom of God, Jesus says, comes without observation. And so it's not going to be, it's not some big, great, mighty, boom, open skies moment that is going to come in and influence your life or influence your surroundings. Jesus uses the premise of the seed and the loaf as the kingdom of God starts as something insignificant. But in the end, it overtakes and overwhelms everything that it comes in contact with. You ever felt like that? You ever felt insignificant in your family or insignificant in your workplace, insignificant in your, your sphere of influence and, and territory or dominion? Like, who am I to influence anyone? You're in exactly the right spot where Jesus wants you because what you have to realize is it's not relying on yourself to be the influence. It's relying on the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the influence to those that are, around, that are around you. Joseph was the most despised by his own brothers. He wouldn't have seen himself as significant at all after what happened to him. Saul, King Saul, answered when he was called and said, Am I not a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? So everyone seems to be able to have an amazing excuse as to why not. Or I can't. King David was the least of all his brothers. Gideon replied, But Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least important member of my family. Excuse after excuse after excuse as to why I can't do, I can't do, and I can't do. But God isn't looking for your excuses as to why you can't. He's waiting for you to see that with God all things are possible, and if the kingdom of God is in you, you have been empowered with the leaven of heaven. 
You've been empowered with the leaven of heaven. That's a nice little cliche that just came to me putting these notes together. You've been empowered with the leaven of heaven. And it may seem insignificant to you, but whatever you come across, as long as you've got the kingdom of God with you, as long as the kingdom is within and overflowing and you are walking in the realm of the kingdom, you will, you can, and you will again influence your surroundings for the glory of the name of Jesus and the establishing of his kingdom. Now I've got other notes here I could go through, but I know we're nearly, we're nearly pretty much out of time. But both parables are inclusive of men and women, so your gender has nothing to do with it. The kingdom has small beginnings, but keeps growing until its influence permeates and prevails over all the earth. The kingdom always influences, enhances, and changes its surroundings. And the kingdom dictates its own outcome. It doesn't matter what it faces. The kingdom will always dictate its own outcome because the kingdom rules over everything and will not be stopped by anything, not even the gates of hell itself. All you need is a sprinkle of leaven. You don't have to be the flower. Too many people want to be the dough. All you need is the sprinkle of the kingdom of God to manifest in your life and that will begin to change your entire surroundings according to the truth of the word of God. If you're sitting next to someone, just go, Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle yourself, sprinkle your friends, sprinkle your family. It doesn't take a lot to produce great change. This is what Jesus is saying to you. It doesn't take a lot to produce great change. But all you need is a sprinkle of the kingdom of God. Put the leaven in the flour. Put the seed in the earth. And the key to producing the seed in the ground to reducing the dough that is needed to mix the leaven with the flour is water. And the water that you need is the Holy Spirit. Let him overflow you. Rivers of living water flowing out of your belly and influencing the entirety of the seed and the leaven in your life. Bless you this morning. Praise the Lord for the kingdom of God being established in you. Go forth this week. Be not influenced by the things of this world, but go and change them for the glory of his name and the establishing of his kingdom in all the earth. Amen. Bless you this morning.